Welcome to Mechanics of Composite Materials. Today we will we'll be discussing the first order shear deformation theory. Similar to classical plate theory, what we want to do is to simplify 3D models into plates by tracking the mid surface. And we call such models structural models. In this case, the first order shear deformation theory extends upon the classical plate theory. First order shear deformation theory can account for thick plates. If you recall, classical plate theories work for thin plates where the thickness was fairly small compared to the other two dimensions. In this case, we can consider thicker plates such as sandwich structures. Sandwich structures can be fairly thick compared to the other two dimensions of the structure. Uh, in this case, a line initially normal to the mid-surface may not remain normal to the mid-surface during deformation. In classical plate theory, we talked about the normal staying normal to the mid-surface after it deformed. Here you have the situation of uh, the bending of that plate. And here you can see that during shear, during this loading applied, there's also shear whereby the angles that were initially in 90 degrees could also change angles. The combination of bending and transfer shear deformation account for the total deformation you may see when you apply a load. I invite you right now to take in a um, thick book, such as a phone book, which may not exist anymore, but any thick book that you may have at home. If you were to bend it, you will see that the edge of that book is going to is going to have significant amount of shear and the way you can see that is that the pages are sliding past each other quite a bit and so you can see there that there's significant amount of slipping and as a consequence the shear deformation is quite significant if you were to take a very thin notebook for example and you were to bend that thin notebook, you will notice how uh, there's very little deformation at the very edge of that notebook. And that's, why, that's because the normal has stayed almost perpendicular to the mid-surface. That is not the case for thick plates. And so this first order shear deformation becomes very useful for the modeling of sandwich structures. In first order shear deformation theory, we had discussed how the normal stays perpendicular to the mid surface. But in this theory, now you do have a shear term contribution. This transfer shear term was ignored in classical play theory, and we stated that that transfer shear strain was equal to zero. Uh, recall that gamma xz in this case, corresponds to the angle change between the x and z axis. If I have a 90 degree uh, square, um, that square will stay at 90 degrees angles as you deform the plate in classical plate theory. But now that angle can be changed. And so we've added that flexibility in this first order shear deformation theory. This first order shear deformation theory was developed by Reisner Middling for isotropic materials. The total deformation of the system as you bend the plate is given by the sh this shear, but also the slope of the mid surface can be accounted for. The assumptions in this, or this theory is that the material behavior is orthotropic and linear elastic and this in this case the out of plane shear stress are no longer zero the displacement assumptions now in that case are given by these deflection assumptions notice how we have made the deflections of the 3d plate to be a function of mid surface deflections and then is also a linear uh is linearly varying with respect to z in this manner where these functions of z are not known. I, wa I want to point out that 
we're tracking the mid surface, but now we're also tracking additional quantities that tells us about the whole plate deflection. Notice how this is X, Y, and Z. So I can tell you the behavior of that plate through the whole plate only by tracking the, these mid surface quantities that you see here one, two, three, four, and five. And we've been able to accomplish that by making the in plane deflections U and V, the deflections in the X and the Y direction, to be a function, linear function, uh, in, this, in the through the thickness direction. You can also see here that W now is the transverse deflection in the Z direction. We're assuming that there's no thickness change, meaning that it doesn't matter where I am through the thickness of the plate, that the transverse deflection will be very close to each other, meaning there's no thickness changes to that plate. If we were to substitute the deflection assumptions into the strain deflection relationships, which were previously described for linear geometry, not for nonlinear geometry, if we were to substitute these deflections assumptions into these six components of strain, then we will come up with five non-zero strains. You can see them here. Epsilon XX, Epsilon YY, Gamma XY, these three correspond to the in-plane strains of the composite laminate. While these two strains used to be zero in classical plate theory, they're no longer zero. And these shear, transverse shear strains um, correspond also to the angle change in that plane. If you were to initially start with a square, the angle change of that square corresponds to this shear strain. Notice how we can quickly recover classical plate theory by setting gamma to zero and then solving for, for C, Y, and C, X, and then plugging it back here into this equation. Then I get three strains and I'll get exactly what I got for classical plate theory. Notice how I don't have epsilon Z, Z. Epsilon Z, Z, zero, because we have assumed that the transverse deflection does not depend on Z. In other words, the derivative of W respect to Z is zero. With these five non-zero strains, the unknowns of these theories becomes five. One, two, three, four, five, which means I need five equations to be able to solve for these five deflections or these five kinematic deflections, quantities. So I can take these strains that you see here and we can put them in a way they're easy to digest. I want you to notice how these in-plane strains, they're a function of mid-surface quantities, but they're also a function of Z through the thickness following these gradients of this Cx and Cy. Notice how gamma yz and gamma xz do not depend on z, so therefore they're constants, they're constant across the thickness of that plate, composite plate. If I were to put this into a matrix format, which is very convenient, we will see that we will find an expression such as this one. Five components of strains that fully describe the strain field through the whole thickness of the composite is equal to mid-surface strains, plus we also have these two here, which also are the shear strains and are the same everywhere through the thickness, plus Z times these quantities here. And I want you to notice how these terms can be put in here and these terms can be put in here. And these terms correspond to the curvature of the plate these three quantities correspond to the shear sh shears, uh, or sorry, the in-plane strains in the mid-surface. And then these two quantities represent the transverse shear strains. I will now look at the constitutive law that we have previously described. 
If you recall, the stress in the local material orientation system can be related to the strains through this constitutive law, where Q11, Q12, and Q22 are given here, and E11, E22, NU12, and G12 can be found through ASTM standards. We also have now two stresses that relate to two strains, shear strains, transverse shear strains that used to be zero, are now existent in this theory. We have the shear moduli, the transfer shear moduli, which can be also calculated with the isopesco test as it was previously discussed. So now we have, in classical play theory, we did not have these two extra stresses being discussed. I will now transform these stress-strain relationships using very similar approach that we use in the classical play theory. And I want to transform the stress strain relationship so that it goes from the material coordinate system to the global coordinate system in the X, Y, Z coordinate system. And this is what we found last time. These terms right here that relate stress to strain were related to these Q bar relationships, which were, are given here on the right hand side. What changed this time is that now we're also transforming the transverse shear strains, stresses. You can see here how that was transformed and how Q4 bar bar, Q4 five, Q4 five bar and Q5 five bar can be found through these equations. I invite you to go back to the classical plate theory and go and revisit all this stuff again so that we can better follow this first order shear deformation theory, which is really intended to tackle thick plates. I'm going to now define through a thickness force and moment resultants. And these ones we have previously discussed. Here alpha and beta are take values of um, x and y. So this is xx, sigma xx, xy, and then you can have xy sigma xy, nyy is sigma yy. So you have three components here of force resultants. You also have three components of moment resultants, mxx, sigma xx here. nyy, sigma yy. mxy, sigma xy. We have also now transverse shear terms. Qx, sigma xz, Qy, sigma yz. So these have been integrated through a thickness. And the reason we're doing that is because we have reduced everything to the mid surface so we can track the mid surface alone. By doing so, we have simplified 3D structures into a structural model that accounts for tracking the mid surface alone. We've simplified the problem by making the deflection assumptions, an ex explicit function of z. So that's quite convenient uh, approach that we came up with. And so continuing here, what we got now is that we can now write the, we can actually through a thickness, integrate these equations. And these equations are these ones here, these stresses were given like that. So we can integrate it through a thickness from the bottom ply to the top ply. And what we found in the classical plate theory is that the in-plane force resultants and the moment resultants can be related to the curvatures and the mid-surface strains, in-plane mid-surface strains, and the curvatures through the ABD matrix. And that has not changed today. The new aspects of these, today's lecture is the addition of transverse shear resultants, which now have this form. QY, QX is related to these transverse shear strains through the A matrix where A44, A45, A45, and A55 can be calculated in a very similar way as the A matrix was calculated. Note that this force 
and moment resultants correspond to internal quantities that resist ex the external loads applied to the structure. If you recall, the ABD matrices were calculated in this manner. And in today's edition of calculating A44 and A45 and A55, you will simply be using this equation right here, where Q bar bar was fully defined earlier, and it can be calculated for every ply, and it's going to depend on theta. This term right here depends on the location through the thickness of that particular lamina, but you'll be summing it all up from the bottom ply to the very top ply. Similar calculations we discussed before. I'm going to now adopt the theorem of total potential energy to derive the equations of equilibrium. We did that in the very last lecture when we discussed the energy methods and we applied it to classical plate theory. Today we're going to apply it to first order shear deformation theory, which is an extension of classical plate theory because it accounts for the idea that you can actually now tackle thick plates compared to thin plates by adding the transverse shear strains as a potential uh, non-zero term, which can be reduced to zero by, by adopting thin plates. So you can actually revert back to classical plate theory quite easily. If you recall the strain energy density was defined as a, as a stress transpose times strain. Stress equals the, the, the C matrix, the stiffness matrix times the strain. We can now distribute the transpose over here in this manner. And that means I have to revert, uh, uh, reorder this in this manner. C is a symmetric six by six stiffness matrix, which then uh, basically becomes this. We're gonna now apply uh, the assumptions for first order shear deformation theory. So this is the strains and this is your sh sh uh, strains, the transfer shear strains. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put everything in a vector so it's easy for us to track what is going on. And the vector is going to have, the strain components is, are going to be these strain components, and sorry, it's going to have these strain components, these strain components, and then it's going to have these strain components. So we're going to have a, a column vector of eight, these three, these three, followed by these two. And when I distribute sigma bold transpose over the strain bold, what I effectively get is the in-plane stresses are acting over this uh, in-plane uh, mid-surface strains and then the curvatures. Plus, this new term that we did not have before, which corresponds to the transfer shear energy term. I invite you to go at home and show that this is what you will get. I'm gonna now apply the strain energy of the plate by integrating the strain energy density over the whole volume. Notice how the volume has a dz times dA. This is the volume term here, but I decomposed it into dz so that it's through, so I can now integrate through the thickness from minus h half to h half, and then I have dA, which represents an element area in the plane of the plate. I'll continue now and notice how epsilon naught is not a function of z, so I can bring this outside of the integral in this manner. Kappa is not an integral, is not a function of z, so I can bring it outside of this integral in this manner. And I can also notice here how none of this is a function of z, so I'll bring this outside of the integral again. And I quickly notice how I had calculated these terms as n bold, m bold, and q bold. And that was defined right here, right here. In con this con initial notation is what it's called but it's basically in essence uh, 
this n bold vector, this m bold vector, and then q bold vector. So that's what we got. We got there. Um, I have also shown all the terms shown here for your convenience, so you can remember how n bold is the in-plane stress resultants n x x n y y and the in-plane shear stress resultants. Then we have MXX, MYY, and MXY. Here S is really XY. And we have MXX, which acts to bend the plate about the Y axis. MYY acts to bend the plate about the X axis. And MXY serves to twist the plate. We also have these new two terms. They are not shown here, but they represent the transfer shear stress in this plate, and it's acting in the through the thickness direction. So this is uh, what we got. We got these two in classical plate theory. Now we have this extra term for first order shear deformation theory. I'm going to go ahead and substitute this as n bold. This is M bold and this is Q bold. And I'm going to put now, uh, I'm going to try to get it all in matrix notation even further. If you recall, in classical play theory, showed that M bold and M bold are related through the ABD matrix and the strain and the kappa, the curvatures. So, what I've done here, we've substituted N bold and M bold by AB. BD, the ABD matrix times the epsilon kappa. The order got shifted because we have a transpose. This here represents a one by six. This is six by six, and this is six by one. So therefore I get a scalar quantity, which is what energy is. Plus we have the shear strains, A bold, which is this one right here, and gamma bold. Again, this is a one by two, a two by two, and a two by one. So I get a scalar quantity again. The potential energy due to load applied is if you were to subject this plate to this applied loading, this non-uniform distributed load applied. And the potential energy is really these forces, these distributed forces moving through the deflections. W, the double integral of that is the work done by these forces. So then the total potential energy of the system, which now depends on U, V, and W, is equal to the total strain energy plus the work done by the applied forces or the potential energy. And that is equal to what we found just earlier right now so this came this u comes from here in this page and then this v is this one right here and we're going to use a principle of minimum potential energy which states that among all the deflections u v and w there's one set of them that minimizes this total potential energy and that set of deflections satisfies the governing equations of elasticity, but they also render the system in equilibrium. And notice how uh, we don't only have U, V, and W from classical play theory, but we also have gamma X and C, Y, I'm sorry, as additional variables that need to be found. So I expect five equations actually that will allow us to solve for these five deflections. Um, so I hope it's clear so far what we're trying to accomplish. So we simplify the expression for the total potential energy. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this into one by eight, an eight by eight, and an eight by one. So what I've done, I've absorbed all this into even more compact format in this manner. And I'm going to call this the G bold vector, this one the H bold vector, and this the G bold vector. So what I'm going to do now is find 
the first version of pi and set that equal to zero, which is what we did in the last lecture using energy theorems. So the first version of pi will then mean that I have the first version of g respect times h times g plus g times h times the first version of g. And then now I also have the first version of w. So go back to the last lecture. I invite you to do that and go through the energy theorem again. And so now I can uh, do a little trick and rearrange everything by bringing the transpose above so that the order is arranged in this manner. And we realize that H bold transpose is the same as H bold. And so in reality, I really have, although I have one half here, these two are the same in reality. So I basically have the one half gone away and I have this in this manner. And I'll rewrite everything in this manner. So the first version of pi equals to zero. And this is the approach that we found that can allow us to find the governing equations using the ideas of calculus of variations, as it was discussed in the previous lecture. And now I'm going to uh, revert back to what I used to have. So these terms right here can be put into n bold, n bold, q bold, because this multiplication here is exactly that. This stays here. And then now what I have is. Then I'm, find, I'm trying to find the deflections uv, c1 and c2, and w that minimize pi by setting the first version of pi equal to zero. And so what I really have then, after multiplying all this, uh, I will get this. And I invite you to show this at home. Alpha and beta here are repeated indices, which means that alpha takes values of one and two. So therefore, you have to put a summation in front of this alpha equals one through two, and beta equals one through two. And you, I guarantee you, you will find um, that what we, when you multiply these things, you will get these exact same expressions. Now, I've been going back and forth between x, y, and z, and using one and two. But anytime you see one and x, it's the same. And when you see two is y, and I'm doing that to be able to use this compact notation. Another way to look at this is that alpha varies from x to y and beta varies from x to y. Bottom line here is that you have four terms because you have two uh, double summation. And also you have four terms here. And then you have just uh, this term. But the, you're now uh, just summing on alpha, which is x, uh, uh, from x to y. And so now you can integrate by parts. So we can go ahead and integrate our parts and remove this comma beta. Remember, that's what we did for classical play theory. So I did this in this term. So integrate by parts, remove the beta and put it on this side, remove the beta and put it on this side, and then here remove the alpha and put it on this side. The bottom terms go back into the integral while these cross terms go into the boundary conditions, which we'll not be discussing in this uh, particular set of notes. But when I multiply this by that, I get this term. This by that, I get this term. And when I multiply this by that, I get this term. So the first version of pi equals to zero. My goal is to find u, v, cx, cy, and w to minimize pi. And this is how we do it. I invite you to show, I invite you to show that for arbitrary values of del u, del c, and del w, these coefficients must be equal to zero. And if you were to use double summation symbol at the beginning of this, you'll find that these are the five equations that you will get that if were to be solved, will minimize the total potential energy. So here are the governing equations. In classical play theory, we had very similar equations as well. And I invite you to go again, go back there and revisit that for classical play theory. The governing equations can be quickly extended to dynamics um, by adding the mass times acceleration term, which is what you see here. The kinetic energy is really one half mass times velocity squared, 
Uh, so this is really a density and this is velocity square terms. I invite you to show that what you will get is this uh, dynamic, dynamic terms on the right hand side. You can use Hamilton's principle to demonstrate that this is what we will get, but I don't want to go too deep into that. My point is that the first order shear deformation theory can be found by this five set of equations where we have accounted for the motion, transverse motion of that plate. And each of these i's that you see here, i naught, i1, and i2, because I have to integrate through a thickness uh, from minus h half to h half, you'll find very similar expressions to what we found with the ABD matrix. Those will need to be calculated if you want to apply uh, these ideas of uh, dynamics for the first order shear deformation theory. And I don't want to spend too much time into that. Feel free to pause the video and for extra credit, if you can find this, uh, that would be awesome. I'll call you the king of motion dynamics if you can get this done. But very similar idea on how we develop the, develop the ABD matrices. So I want to continue here, and if you look, examine the boundary conditions that fall out, you will see that either you apply loads at the at the boundaries, or you specify the deflections. In other words, when you're working on a problem, you have two opportunities or possibilities. One possibility is that you specify the deflections, and the other possibility is that you specify loading conditions. So what is the logic flow on how to solve for U, V, and W, and C, X, and C, w, C, Y? Um, what is the way to do that? And these are, by the way, U, V, and W. U, V are the deflections in the in-plane directions, but they correspond to the deflections in the mid-surface of that lamina sandwich structure. W is a transverse deflection. Cx and Cy are associated with a shear of that plate in the through a thickness direction. So what we want to do then is solve for those five variables, and the way to do that is to plug these two into this constitutive law, and then plug all that into these five equations, and that way I can get everything in terms of u, v, and w. Cx and Cy. As you know, see here, you get five unknowns and five partial differential equations are highly coupled. And as discussed before, this is very cumbersome to solve or to solve using uh, ideas from mathematics on how to solve partial differential equations in an exact way. Instead, we can use approximation theory and we can solve for these deflections approximately. And the idea there is that it, it will serve as a foundation for finite elements, which we're not really discussing in this course, but uh, just wanted to point out that typically you use finite elements, and finite elements is really solving for these equations uh, using approximation methods that we'll be discussing in a minute. So here is a principle of minimum potential energy for the plate. And the idea was to find the deflections U, V, and W, C, X, and C, Y, that minimize the total potential energy. And we found that U, V, and W, C, X, and C, Y, the ones that solve these five partial differential equations, these five partial differential equations, are the ones that minimize the total potential energy, but they also render the system in equilibrium. And this is very, very difficult to solve. So what if we use, we use approximation methods such as write a rich? And the idea is that you're gonna write each of these deflections as approximations of polynomials or sine functions or some function that you know. These fees are known, fully known. These fees are fees that you select on purpose. And as a consequence now, the unknowns just become these coefficient Cs, which I put a superscript there that looks quite complex, but, but it's not. You could have used different variables like A sub I, B sub I, uh, 
and so forth. But I just wanted to use CI and superscript U to denote that U is for that deflection, V is for this deflection, W is for that deflection. The bottom line is that these Cs are the only things that are unknown now because we have already selected the form of the approximation. The basis functions is what we call these Cs. So those functions are known, and all I have to do now is substitute this crazy expression, these five approximations into the total potential energy. And when I do that, I can now minimize pi relative to each of these Cs. And when I do that, I can now have a linear system of equations that allows us to solve for the Cs. And once I know Cs, I know how these deflections uh, vary across a plate. And I also understand this, I can find this Cx and Cy functions as well. So again, these are uh, uh, this a purity approximation method, and it's called the Riley Ritz approximation method. So let's discuss sandwich structures. What is the benefit of sandwich structures? The advantage of sandwich structures compared to laminates is that for the very similar weight, you can achieve a higher bending stiffness and there's a greater resistance to buckling under the same bending moment than if you were to have a thin laminate. And the way we accomplish that, if you think about it, if you were to have thin laminates and I were to move them further apart and put a weak material in between, what I've really done is increase the bending stiffness quite a bit. And that is shown here. If I were to calculate the D matrix, for isotropic phase sheets. So say I have isotropic phase sheets with some sort of core thickness. And we have that the bending stiffness can be found to be the phase sheet not modulus, which is fairly high compared to the core modulus here in the middle term. Um, but I'll go ahead and integrate that. I'll integrate the bottom phase sheet through the thickness. I have minus H minus F to minus h, and then I have the core, which goes from minus h to h, and then I have the phase sheet, which goes from h to h plus f. And so here, what I have now is, uh, I have found this to be the expression for the bending stiffness after I work through this. <clears throat> and so if the bending stiffness with no core so there's no core, H is zero. All this goes away. So the bending stiffness is simply two thirds EF F cubed. Okay, so that's, that's very clear that that's what you will get. I want you to notice how very quickly you recover EI for the bending stiffness. If you notice here, if F is H over two, which is our case, um, not H over two, but uh, you will see that you get uh, something very similar to what you have gotten for a laminate. So yes, this is H, um, typically, uh, H over 2. And so you have gotten uh, 1 over 12 E H cubed, which is very similar to EI, except now we're missing the, the, the width direction. The reason that's not showing up is because it's bending stiffness it's not the same bending stiffness as for a beam. In the beam, we have integrated through the thickness, but also through the width. While for plate theory, we have only integrated through the thickness, and that's why the width is not showing up here. But this is very similar to EI that you have gotten for a beam, except without the B for the width. Um, so with no core, you get this expression. If I compare to bending stiffness comparison of the sandwich versus the laminate, for almost the same weight, so I'll take this expression, which is for the whole sandwich, and divided by this one for the plate with no core, and I work, work it through, this is what I get. And if I use representative values for a sandwich structure, so take the core is one inch, take the face sheet is 0 0.05 inch, take the core stiffness, which is 1,000 PSI, and a phase sheet similar to aluminum. I get that the bending stiffness for a sandwich is at least 
1,000 times more than the laminate. So that's just the benefit of sandwich structures. So I can also look at the fish stress in the outer fibers. You will see that the fish sheet in the outer fibers is also affected. Uh, if I were to calculate uh, the laminate stresses, the, lamina, the stresses for lamina, laminate, compared to stresses for sandwich structure, the laminate stresses will have much higher stress than if I were to have a sandwich structure because I have more bending resistance. Therefore, uh, for sandwich structure, you will see less fascia stresses as well. And I invite you to kind of go through the calculations for the fascia stress, which can be calculated with this formula, and then compare the laminate versus the sandwich by taking this ratio. So what we've really done is we've actually constructed almost like an I-beam. That's what you do with the I-beam. You put the flanges as apart as possible and put very minimal material in between, which we call web. The farther apart the fish is are, the greater the bending stiffness. And that concept is very similar for an I-beam. You can see that this empty area here uh, basically reduces the average uh, modulus between these flanges. That's what this sandwich structure is doing. Both of these are improving the bending resistance by quite a bit. The core carries typically the transverse shear loading, so this core is doing the work for that, while the fascias take the in-plane loads or the bending loads as well. I invite you to go to the hexcel.com resources data sheet and look at the Honeycomb um, design technology. And I think you'll find a lot of great information on data specs for that kind of stuff. I want to go here to the HexWeb Honeycomb Sandwich Design Technology. This is a Hexcel Composites handbook for this stuff. And you can see here that it explains that the Honeycomb Sandwich Structure is one of the most valued structural engineering innovations for the composite industry. Sandwich structures are used in rudders. They take uh, quite a bit of uh, bending stiffness, as we discussed. They're very low weight, high stiffness and durability. And you can see here through this data spec information about the various sandwich structures you can have. So here you have, you have the failure or the contents, the contents of this design technology handbook. And it goes through uh, some uh, information about uh, conventions. It talks about um, nomenclature. It talks about heat transfer, moisture, uh, strength, stiffness, environments. It talks about the comparisons between various materials. It also talked about cell shapes skin materials, cell size, adhesive materials that can be used for bonding composites. It will also talk about loads, deflections, the failure modes you can have, skin compression failure, so the skin fails, excessive deflections due to perhaps the core has lost its stiffness, panel buckling, sheer crimpling, skin wrinkling, intracell buckling, and shear crimpling here is the core thickness in the shear modulus has to be adequate to prevent the core from prematurely failing in shear. That's very important. The skin wrinkling can happen when the composite modulus of the face, the facing skin and the core compression strength. These two, the comp compression modulus of the face skin and the core compression strength have to be high enough to prevent this kind of failure mode. We also want the core cell size to be small enough so you don't get intracellular buckling. You can also have impact events that cause local failure of the core. And 
you need to basically do a few calculations to really size this kind of designs, stiffness, deflection, and so forth. And you can see here the kinds of information that you have to look at for um, sizing a design. Here are some hand calculations that go through uh, for various situations. So I invite you to take a look at the, at the website, uh, the material there, and I think uh, you'll find a lot of helpful information, uh, including manufacturing um, and also safety. And then towards Appendix I, what you will find is various alum aluminum materials and nomics, and it's going to provide you the density, the cell size, and that's going to give you the modulus and strength and compression and the tr transverse shear strength and also the transverse modulus in both the longitudinal and uh, the weft direction. Appendix 2 goes into additional information for phase sheet materials, such as carbon epoxy and so forth. Appendix 3 goes into some beam equations. And then towards the end, they give you additional uh, recommendations for further reading. I really recommend getting these two books, An Introduction to Sandwich Constructions by Zinkert, a very great book in this, in this area. So re returning back to our lecture here, uh, there are various types of sandwich constructions. You have a corrugated uh, type of honeycomb, foam honeycomb, and honeycomb in this material. So three sandwich constructions, uh, this one honeycomb type uh, that you can see here. Um, these are the cell walls. And then uh, notice how uh, you could have a repetitive cell pattern uh, that could basically make up the honeycomb core. And the mechanical performance based on the hexel uh, sheet uh, will show you that the highest strength performing materials are aluminum 5052, 5056. You can see stiffness also is improved and the strength is also improved. And then this is the same material I just discussed from the Hexel website. And again, it provides density, cell size, and then strength and modulus uh, information. You can also have various types of foam cores, thermosets and thermoplastic polymers, including polyvinyl, chloride, polyurethane, polyesterine, styrene, and other types of materials like PMI. The foams can be manufactured various, you can find them at various densities, and examples of foam cores that are used even in surfboards can include Rohacel, Divinencel, Aerex, and many others. The failure modes of composite sandwich structures need to be discussed. We can have face sheet failure in this manner. We can have core shear failure in this manner, so the core cracks in this manner. You can have face sheet wrinkling or core crushing. Core crushing. You can have buck buckling or delamination. If you have a D bond between the face sheet and the core, it can cause this kind of delamination, and it can pop the face sheet or break the fibers. You also have this misalignment situation that can lead to a shear crimping type of failure mode. And then you can have a situation where the cell size is large enough and the compression stress is la large enough where locally the, the face it buckles. And all these ones are, in, are, con, are considered instability phenomena due to compression loads. These ones can occur when there's high shear loading. These ones can occur when there's high bending stresses. So the failure modes can be quite significant. And for phase sheet, you want to really track intralaminar. So basically, in intralaminar, meaning in the ply in plane directions, and interlaminar failures. You also have phase sheet wrinkling, which depends on the in plane compression loads. Uh, you also want to take a look at for core shear failure, you want to look at the transverse shear loads in the core. And then for sure crimping, you want to look at the large, the potential for large auto plane deformation due to buckling. You could have core indentation issues as well that could cause core to crush. 
such as an impact damage event. Face sheet wrinkling instability uh, occurs when the face sheet are simply too thin to support the applied in-plane loads. The face sheet can be considered to be placed resting on an elastic foundation. That's what people have. The people that came up with solutions to this, that's how they looked at it. They looked at a face sheet that's resting on an elastic foundation. And failure occurs when the face sheet buckles out of the core or into the core. So either of these two scenarios. You can see here that if you have a sandwich structure with face sheets that are fairly thick and you apply compression loading, it's unlikely that this face sheet will pull away like that or push into like that. But it could happen if you have thin laminates. For face sheet wrinkling instability, there are closed form solutions. I want to discuss one such solution. And the idea there is that the in-plane deflections will be close to zero, while the transverse deflection will be significant. And here, what we want to do is plug it into the total potential energy for simplified um, problem. And here, we're only looking like a beam type problem. So we're not looking at a plate. But uh, the idea is to demonstrate and illustrate the energy method, the total potential energy. We made, here is the total potential energy, which only de depends on the deflection through a thickness. Here is the bending stiffness. And NX is a compression load applied. So I can now minimize pi to find a deflection through a thickness. And notice how W was made up to be C1 sine and so this C function is not known. This coefficient here is not known. But this function is known. A is the length of the panel. So when I plug this into this equation, I turn pi only a function of A, or C, I'm sorry, which allows me then to take the derivative of pi respect to C, set it equal to zero to find C. So, if you minimize the total potential energy, you can then find a load that it takes to buckle the panel. And here's the equation. Uh, for large values of M, and M is a half sine waves from this assumption here. So M is the number of half waves, half waves into the phase sheet buckles. And so for large values of M, this is what I get. And that will give you wrinkling loads that look like this. This example is uh, taken from a colleague of mine that's highly respected, Dr. Scott Peck. Beta here is the foundation of that uh, um, core. So these are beta is a representation of that. So more accurate formulas do exist. Uh, here is one such formula. Nu here is a Poisson ratio. Uh, in this case, the Poisson ratio of the transverse uh, of the of the core, but Poisson ratio in that direction, x z, like that. You also have it to the minus one third power. This is a phase sheet uh, uh, modulus to the one third, and e three three corresponds to a three through a thickness modulus of the phase sheet. And so you can calculate the phase sheet wrinkling. Um, that phase sheet uh, stress that could cause uh, wrinkling. There are other, many other equations you can find. Here is a literature. The title of the NASA article is Phase Sheet Wrinkling in Sandwich Structures, NASA CR 1999, and then the version is 2008 994. Here is an example of the kinds of phase sheet wrinkling. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. The phase sheet wrinkling uh, stresses, you can see there's a wide variety of equations that people have developed from various sources. It's important to understand that this is fairly normal to see um, uh, different equations from different people. A conservative assumption can be used that could envelope all these equations, I invite you to go ahead and, and account for that. Here in these formulas, you can see how the core got involved and it was, in, it was considered in these calculations. 
Intracellular buckling or fascia dimpling happens when this cell diameter is quite significant. And so that will cause buckling uh, of this cell or this fascia. And so since the fascia here is not supported only by these edges, it can buckle. Especially if the cell size is large enough. We can also do uh, a calculation of fascia dimpling. The total potential energy of a circular symmetric classical plate, and here what we're doing is looking at this circle that sur is, is circumscribed into this hexagon. And the idea is to see what compression loading can cause this circular section to buckle. And so what we've done is uh, use the total energy of the system, uh, we're going to make an assumption that the deflections follow this formula. And so what we want to do is determine uh, what amplitude causes this, uh, can potentially buckle it. Uh, we find that the buckling load uh, is going to be a function of the bending stiffness, where D is a cell size. Again, this is taken from a colleague of mine, Dr. Scott Peck, but it also further shows how the right at risk approximation can be successfully used rather than solving very complex finite element models, you can approximate the solution. Here is a intracellular buckling calculations. Another one that's more accurate, uh, here modulus E of the phase sheet, uh, T is the phase sheet thickness and alpha is the cell size new FXY is a phase sheet Poisson ratio. So this actually is very accurate. Uh, this one is an approximation. You can also look at the over, uh, overall elastic, elastic instability. That means I apply a load globally to a structure and that causes a global instability of the structure. Here we assume that the implant deflections are zero and that we only have an outer plane deflection and that we may have some amount of shear deformation in this plane. And here, since we're not looking at the through the thickness direction and the into the pitch direction, then this gamma y, the CY is set to zero. So we wanna see what it takes to buckle a panel from the global perspective. We can again use right at rates and then plug it into this total potential energy and again, this here is a bending energy, this is shear energy, and this is a potential load due to the load applied, or the work done due to the load applied. And in this case, it's a compression load that's getting applied in this manner. When I plug everything in, I plug these approximations. Now the total potential energy only depends on C1 and C2. I can find the due to pi with respect to C1, the due to pi with respect to C2, and then solve for the buckling load. And what we, we found is that the buckling load is equal to this equation right here. Pi is 3.14, D is a bending stiffness, H is the thickness of that, um, basically is the thickness of that sa sandwich structure. And then A here corresponds to the, to the length. There, uh, there are ways to calculate um, this equation using finite elements. That is a preferred method for more complicated problems. NASA SP8007 provides buckling calculations of sandwich structures subject to various conditions, and I invite you to take a look at that. Fatal modes of composite sandwich structures continue here. We have the shear crimping situation. And in this case, we want to make sure the core thickness and shear modulus be adequate enough to prevent the core from failing in a shear type fader mode in this manner. So if I apply load, compression loading, suddenly you can have this crimping, crimping instability. The shear crimping instability can also be analyzed by selecting deflections and assumptions of how it may deform and here is an assumption that people have taken in the past. Here is 
the formula that we just use for the total potential energy. This is for a beam, basically, not for a plate, but you can apply for a plate. And here's the zone of the instability. So we're going to evaluate that over the zone of the instability. And that's where B shows up. And then again, you can then determine the shear crimping, uh, and you can find it. And here's a formula for uh, uh, shear crimping. Um, I, this is also a formula for shear crimping that you will find through this, from this calculus. So substitute this stuff, these approximations into this equation, take the derivative of pi respect to C1 and C2, and then you're gonna be able to solve for the buckling load. That buckling load is this one right here. It was found. B is a zone of the shear crimping. And then you have here the, an approximation that you can make. And this is the approximation, approximation you can make. You don't want the in-plane stress resultant to be greater than the thickness times G13, the shear modulus, transfer shear modulus. H here is the distance between the middle surface of the facings or the core um, thickness. Here, there's another formula from the Manual for Structural Stability of Sandwich Plates and Shells. NASA CR 1457 provides the shear crimping equation as this one. So again, you're gonna see a lot of different formulas in the literature, uh, but there are, are practical ways to calculate these formulas. The core shear failure can be found by determining the core shear strength of the ASTM standard C393. I have various papers published with Dr. Jacob Rome, so I invite you to go online and look at uh, papers I have co-authored in testing uh, sandwich structures under three-point bend considerations. You'll also see some papers discussing three-point bend sandwich structures with splices where it connects two cores from either side. Impact damage of sandwich structures can be quite significant where when you have an impact event, it can cause the core to deform. You could also have damage, uh, not much on the other side, on the back side, that's less likely to happen, but it will be absorbed by the core. Uh, and then when you apply compression loading, it can cause failure of the fish prematurely. That's one possibility. Again, uh, I invite you to take a look at one of our papers with Dr. Jacob Rome discussing the impact damage, the compression after impact residual strength due to a damage event caused by an impact event. The there is a paper by the FAA that goes into that. It's called the Guidelines for Analysis, Testing a Non-Destructive Inspection of Impact Damage Composite Sandwich Structures. You can see here that the more the damage is, the lower the compression after impact strength you get. What am I talking about here is if you have a plate and you're subject that to an impact event, when I apply loading and compression, hey, how much load can I get when I have an impact event relative to something that was not impacted? So 1.0 is no damage. Uh, and then when you apply damage, how much strength reduction I got because of, that, of this type of damage event? And you can see here that the damage events can cause degradations in the order of 40, 50%. So it's important to realize that impact damage event Sometimes it may not be visible, but can cause significant amount of underlying damage that should be looked for because it does decrease the compression strength capability of composite sandwich structures. Let's look at this example by Dr. Scott Peck where the deflection of the sandwich structure is analyzed under its own weight. The elliptical sandwich structure mirror deforms under its own weight. We want to determine the core shear stiffness necessary to limit the sag to 25 microns at 1 g's for visible wavelength mirror. We will use the energy method calculation again, once again. We're going to use a bending or, or we're going to basically use cylindrical bending assumptions 
which is basically going back to, to beam bending. We'll calculate the total potential energy, which is given by this equation. And then we're going to look at um, uh, the integral over the, the, the volume of this material. Here, this is an elliptical um, sandwich structure mirror. So this is A and B, and that's why uh, A and B are the ellipse major and minor axis. Rho is the thickness density, and G is acceleration due to gravity. And you can see here that this is how you'll integrate over the area uh, of this uh, mirror for an ellipse. We'll use the risk approximation again, and then we're going to use these approximation functions. You can see here that the unknown coefficients are C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C6, C7, C8, and all these, uh, uh, these two approximations satisfy the boundary conditions exactly. I'll minimize the total potential energy respect to each of these coefficients and set equal to zero. And so I'll have eight equations or eight unknowns that can be solved linearly. And again, you can do all these in finite elements, but this is to illustrate how these approximate techniques um, are very useful. And then to complete the numerical example, we'll take these properties. And here is uh, uh, the, the deflection due to the mirror's act due to gravity. For various types of modulus, you can see you can size this to minimize the deflection. Um, and, and by doing these sensitivities of, by varying G, X, Z, and so forth. What I want to point out, and the reason I kept covering right at Rich today is to demonstrate that the way that finite element works, really, is that it solves these partial differential equations in, in a small repetitive geometry that's simple, such as a triangle, square. And what we're trying to do is demonstrate for you that these energy methods are not only useful to derive the governing equations of a first order shear deformation theory, but to also demonstrate that this is the backbone for finite elements. While I have not gone into finite elements and I don't plan to do so in this particular lecture, you can go into my YouTube video and learn where, how finite elements comes about. And some of these ideas of Riley Ritz are discussed in extensive details and the connections and the evolution from right and rich to fine elements are discussed in extensive details. So with this, we conclude the theoretical aspects of uh, the analysis of classical plate theories, first order shear deformation theories, which are valid for thick plates, and then we'll be moving to more practical practical considerations moving forward.